We hope you'll be blessed and inspired and challenged and motivated by this fresh word from Christian Heritage Church. This bulletin, I have to tell you the story behind it because it's kind of amazing. I felt like the Lord had been speaking to me about a word and I thought maybe it was just a word for myself. And the more I received just confirmation after confirmation, I knew that it was really a word for all of us as the body of Christ. And I knew what the Lord had spoken to me. And I said to Pastor Steve out of the blue, hey, Pastor, he's in Oklahoma, by the way, taking care of some business at his father's property and farm. And I knew he was headed there. And I said, Pastor, is there, are there any crops on the farm? Is there by chance wheat, wheat fields on the farm? And he laughed and he said, Amy, it's like 80% wheat field. And I went, wow. Okay, confirmation number 137. Check God, got it. Okay, that is the message. And then he sent me some pictures. So that picture on the bulletin was not only a confirmation of God's word to you today, that is actually Pastor Steve's father's farm and property. Isn't that amazing? That's pretty good. All right. Um, If you would, let's bow our heads and just pray before we get into the word. Father, I ask right now that you would give us eyes to see what you're doing, uh, ears to hear what the spirit of the Lord is saying. I ask that you would open our hearts, that your word would penetrate and provoke us to change and to obedience to you. Father, thank you that you are so faithful to us. And I ask that you would be in our midst as we dig into your word. Amen and amen. I don't know about you, but I love the word of God because it's absolute truth. In a world where there's a lot of things that are really gray, his word is it's always absolute truth. And I love that. I want you to open your Bibles to Matthew Chapter 9, Matthew, the first book in the New Testament, if you'd open up to Matthew chapter 9. And I want to give you just a little overview of Matthew chapter 9 before we really dig into the text that I believe God wants to talk to us from today. So Matthew chapter 9, if you look at the headings, I'm just going to briefly summarize and go through it and get to the part that I want to focus on today. So we see that Jesus forgives and heals the paralyzed man. He also calls out the teachers of the law, which I love. They have a real holier-than-thou perspective, and he says, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. I can see right through you. I can see your heart and your mind, and I know what you're thinking, and that's evil. I like that part, I don't know why. Jesus calls Matthew into ministry. He explains why the disciples aren't fasting. And he says that there's gonna be a time when the bridegroom is taken away, and in that time, they will mourn and they will fast and they will pray. And what he was saying is there's going to be a day where he will no longer walk among you in flesh and in that day you'll fast and pray. And as I thought about fasting and praying when I read this, you know, if you were to look into scripture about fasting, which pastor has called for a time in September of fasting and prayer, Jesus doesn't reference it very often by saying, if you choose to fast, if you would like to, it might be a good thing for you. If you look in scripture, you will see he actually says, when you fast, while you're fasting. If you look at that verbiage, that's insinuating that if you're a disciple of Christ, it's something you will do as part of your your faith walk with him. So I found that to be interesting in Matthew 9. Jesus heals the two blind men. And just to throw it out there, I always find this very interesting. Jesus went out from there and two blind men followed him. If you're blind, how do you follow someone? Have you ever thought about that? 
Yeah, sound, you know what I think? I think presence. I think when Jesus would walk down the street, I think the atmosphere shifted. I think that immediately people knew that there was something different and they could feel it. And every time I read that, I think, wow, I just think of him walking down the street and I think about the the presence, the atmosphere shifting and changing. And do you know that we have the ability to do that? That his expectation of us is that when we walk down the street, the atmosphere changes. Something shifts. All of a sudden, in a dark place, there's light. All of a sudden, in a place that's hopelessness, hope is automatically brought in. And you know why? Because the same one that those blind men followed lives on the inside of you. So when you walk, that same thing should happen. And if it's not, all we gotta do is press sin a little bit deeper because he's faithful to show up. Amen? Amen. This is where I want to focus, and so we're going to read this text together. Verse 35 says, and the title says, the workers are few. I haven't been able to shake this harvest thing and wheat. I'm telling you, everywhere I go, I've seen this scripture. I've seen wheat, pictures of wheat fields. I mean, it's like, okay, God, I got it the first 20 times. I promise I I will deliver this word. So verse 35, Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. And then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out laborers into his harvest field. And this is where I want to just park the car this morning, and I want to really dig into this text, because I think there are some things that God wants to say to us from this. And the first is, if you were to look in the Greek text of this scripture, you would see that It's not as though the sheep were merely lost for a little bit without a shepherd. If you look at the Greek meaning of what that verse is saying, it's saying that they were actually tormented, worried, harassed. They were like prey among violent robbers. And I believe that the Lord would say to us that that is how he views the lost sheep, those that are not saved. Therefore, we should view the lost sheep as prey among violent robbers. So those that are not in relationship with the Lord are subjected to torment, harassment from the evil one. I believe that he gives us a response. He, he had compassion on them. Therefore, we should have compassion on them. And this is a deep conviction that the Lord laid on me. How often do we view people that are not in relationship with the Lord as they're living in the consequence of their actions? Whew. That wasn't his response. He didn't view them and say, oh, you chose that path, and so now you're reaping the consequence of your actions. It says that he had deep compassion because he saw them as prey to violent robbers. I have been convicted over my own thoughts on this. So easily over the past few months, we've heard of those that were strong in the faith, leaving the faith, doing some really horrible, treacherous things, right? And, you know, choosing atheism and all this stuff over the Father. And my response 
was one that needed some rebuking. And how many of you know Jesus is really gentle and faithful to rebuke you when you need it? And as I read this, the Lord convicted me of my thoughts and said, how often do we view them? And I've even heard people say, oh, were they ever even saved? Oh, shame on us if we would ever say things like that. Do you know what Jude 123 says? That our job, our calling is to snatch those that have doubted and fallen away, to snatch them out of the fires of hell. When we say things like, oh, I wonder if they were ever even saved. Oh, I wonder if they were ever even delivered from that problem. The fear of the Lord hits me every time I say it because it's not how he sees them, and it was not his response. His was one of great compassion. I wanna read verse 37 and 38 to you, but I wanna read it from a different translation. I wanna read it to you from the Passion Translation. Verse 37, he turned to his disciples and said, the harvest is huge and ripe but there are not enough harvesters to bring it all in. As you go, plead with the owner of the harvest to thrust out many more reapers to harvest his grain. Do you know what that means? That Jesus is actually giving us the battle plan. He's giving us the strategy for the lost. For the world that we so desperately want to reach, what is our mission at CHC? To reach all people by all means. It's really simple, right? Well, guess what? The answer is in the book. The strategy has already been written and given to us. It would be like if we were playing a football game and the other team handed you the playbook. And yet we're sitting on it at best, at worst, we're neglecting it. His strategy and command is that we call for the laborers to be thrust forth into the harvest field. And what does that mean? It means his big strategy The big answer, do you want it? Do you want to know how he plans to win the game? It starts with prayer. Did you know that it was that easy? We try a lot of different things, don't we? We're really good at putting together our programs. And God says, wait, hold on. If you just look in the red... I've actually given you the answer. And his answer is a prayer revolution. A prayer, when we pick up the prayer mantle and we start praying, Lord of the harvest, thrust forth laborers into your kingdom. God who is in control of all and contains all all would you god the god that owns the harvest would you thrust forth laborers into your kingdom when we start praying like that and believing that he is not a liar and that his word is true and when he said he would do it he will when we start praying and believing in faith then things happen and it's happening all around us if you open your eyes There was a young woman, this is a true story, I really don't know her name, otherwise I would give it to you. There was a young woman in college and she decides to go to this prayer event at a local church. And at this prayer event, they have a huge wall. And on this wall, there's all these sticky notes. And on the sticky notes, there's names of unreached people groups. And the idea was, was that you would pick one up and you would commit to pray for that unreached people group. 
So she goes and she takes one and it says, Jat people, J-A-T, Jat people. And she says, okay. And then she thought, oh, I could probably pray for two people groups. So she goes to a completely other side of the wall and decides to grab another one and flips it over and looks at it. And it says, Jat people. She said, okay, God, clearly you want me to pray for the Jap people. I will do this. So the young woman commits to praying, Lord of the harvest, thrust forth laborers into the Jap people community, thrust forth laborers to this unreached people group. Fast forward two years later, she goes on a missions trip to India with a small group from her local church. And they're going in India from village to village, sharing the gospel with no success. Everywhere they go is a closed door. There, no one is receptive, no one is open, and they keep going, and they get to the last village of the trip. As they begin to share the gospel, the entire village gets rocked by the gospel of Jesus Christ. And even the chief among them says, this Lord, this Jesus Christ, this savior that you speak of, we want him as our Lord. And the entire village gets swept into the kingdom in one minute. As they begin to leave, they're getting some information to exchange. They want to be able to send Bibles and do different things. And as they prepare to leave and they say, so what is this village or this people group called? The chief looked and he said, the Jat people. You can't tell me that his strategy doesn't work. You can't tell me that God doesn't answer prayers. I've been on the receiving side of it. I know all too well that he does. And I know that he gave us the battle plan. And my conviction is, is that we're neglecting it and we're passively sitting by when he said, you want to reach the lost? Pray that the Lord of the harvest would send forth laborers. And as you do, as you pray that, something in your heart begins to shift. You know what happens? You all of a sudden get the conviction to go as well. There is a word that's translated uh, in the Greek, in verse 38, when we talk about sending, when it says sent out, there's a word, why don't we say it together, it'll help it stick, ekbalo, ekbalo, that's Greek. That word, ekbalo, in verse 38, is not a, if I were to send a letter, I would be I would write the letter, I would address it, I would put it in the mailbox, right? I would put the little flag up, I would send that letter. Ekbalo is not a nice sending of something. That word can be found multiple times through scripture. And let me give you some context for it. Acts 16, 37, Paul is ekbaloed into prison. Do you think that they skipped and, you know, maybe played hopscotch on the way and had a nice sending off? No, he was thrown violently into prison. Acts 7, 58, Stephen is ekbaloed out of the city and stoned to death. Do you think that he was casually walking? No. Are we getting ekbaloed is a, a violent thrust. And lastly, in Luke eleven twenty, 20, God's power and authority ekbalos demons out. So ekbalod is not a, oh, gracious God, if you would choose to, if you would like to, maybe you could send some people 
That's not what the context is saying. It's saying, Lord of the harvest, I command that you thrust forth laborers into Lincoln High School. Lord of the harvest, I demand that you thrust forth laborers into my job. It is a a spiritual violence that is happening. And I believe that that young college girl, I believe that she grabbed a hold of what Iqbalo really means. And she began to pray like it. And then the Lord of the harvest not only answered her prayer, but allowed her to be part of the answer. Ooh, that's good. And that is the God we serve that longs and desires to do that through us. So what does that mean for you and me? I don't know. Sometimes I read these stories and I think, wow, it must be really exciting to be them. Or, wow, that's a really great testimony or story. Do you know that God desires that that's your story? His will, we often pray God's will be done on earth as it is in heaven, and his will is that today you would grab a hold of what this verse really means and that you would take him at his word and you would watch him perform miracles in your midst. God gave us the battle plan, and my prayer is that we would be provoked to action. If you want to see your workplace start to change, we often hear people complain a lot about the workplace. You want to see your workplace start to change? Start to pray, Lord of the harvest, thrust forth laborers into my place of employment. You want to see high schools and middle schools and elementary schools start changing? We don't need a change of administration. We need a change of our mindset to understand that God is who he says he is and his word is true. And if we would start praying like that, we would start to see things shift and change. But instead, we've got our Bibles under our butt and we're just sitting on it and we're not doing anything. And we are really enjoying just complaining about it. Oh, and I don't say that to be mean or harsh. I say that because the Lord convicted me too. I'm right there with you. And if we could grab a hold of the Lord of the harvest, we could start to see some things change. And it starts with prayer. It starts with a commitment to no longer passively sit on this verse, but to take it and to apply it and to say, God, I'm going to take you at your word. You gave me the battle plan and I'm not okay with watching my team just sit there and lose. I'm going to apply the strategy that you gave us and I'm gonna watch you come through because it's who you are and it's what you do. I believe that verse 37 and 38 is the fulfillment. I believe that's it. You want to know how to win the war, how to win the lost? I believe it's 37 and 38. And as you pray, be prepared that he may say, it's you. I'm going to warn you right now that when you pray, God does act and he does move. I began years ago to start to pray for the Arab world. It just, uh, the Lord convicted my heart and I began to pray and really intercede for the Arab world. And one day in my prayer, I was praying, God of the harvest, thrust forth the laborers. And he tapped me on my shoulder and he said, it's you. And within a few months, we had moved to a city that was 98% Muslim Arabs. And sometimes God may call you to be the answer. 
And there are other times that he may just desire you to intercede and to pray and then to watch him move and shift things. If we could have the worship team come back, um, I want to begin to close, but I'm really gonna ask that just from this point forward, you would take an attitude of this that we have a job to do and we haven't really been doing it that well. The good news is God told us how we could do it better and how we could succeed. And all he's looking for, it doesn't even require you to physically do anything right now. All it requires is that your heart be open and obedient to him. That's all. So I'm just going to ask that from this point forward, you would give yourself a little heart check and you would just say, God, I'm open. I am open and willing to give myself as a sacrifice to you. And if it means praying, then that's what I'm going to do. If it means going, then that's what I'm going to do. And you know, going doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to Peru, even though I'm excited about going and I want all of you to go. It doesn't always mean though that you're going to the other side of the world. Going might be, I'm in the grocery store and as I walk out, I see a woman crying and I feel this gentle tug on my heart called the Holy Spirit and I know that I'm supposed to go ask her if I can pray with her. Sometimes prayer and going is somewhere far and big and sometimes it's just a really simple step in this direction. And all we're saying to the Father when we say that our heart is obedient is that we're willing to do whatever it is. If it's one step to the left to meet this person where they're at, or if it means taking three planes and a boat to get to a remote village, we're willing to do it. I wanna close with this story. Raise your hand if you know who David Wilkerson is. So many of you do, great, glad you do. For those of you that don't, I'll give you the 60 second version. In 1958, David Wilkerson was a pastor of a small country church in the hills of Pennsylvania. And he himself was a country boy. So this was pretty familiar, easy, in his comfort zone. Yet David Wilkerson was never okay with just doing church. He always had this deeper desire for something more. And he, just like he did time after time again in the morning, grabbed his cup of coffee, sat down with a newspaper. This morning was different. As he looked at the newspaper, the front page had the faces of several gang members in New York that were on trial. And he began to weep as he looked at their faces because the Holy Spirit had convicted him so strongly and he wondered if anyone had told the boys that Jesus died for them, that they have a savior, that they have hope and that they are loved. He became so deeply convicted over these gang members that he entered a time of fasting and prayer after a short time, that fasting and prayer led to him selling his television in 1958 to get enough gas money to go to New York City, the country boy goes to New York City to find these gang members and tell them the good news of Jesus Christ. That's a good story. When he gets there, he's not prepared for what he was going to find. I believe it was a holy setup, amen? And what he found was that there was a drug epidemic sweeping the streets of New York, and sweeping through the gangs. 
and David Wilkerson with very little knowledge or information on how to help said, God, you did not convict my heart like this to leave me in New York City and having seen all of this. And I'll make a 60 year story really short for you. Thus, Teen Challenge was formed. Thank you, Jesus. And 60 years, thousands and thousands and thousands of people being saved and delivered and set free because of his conviction. But there's a part of the story that doesn't get told very often. And I want you to ask yourself, who's Dick Simmons? Who's that? We all know who David Wilkerson is, right? Who's Dick Simmons? Dick Simmons was a man of prayer. A man that believed that Matthew 9 Verse 37 and 38 held enough power to transform the world. If he were here today, he would tell you that Matthew chapter 9, verse 37 and 38 could literally transform our world if we would take it seriously and do it. He was a man of prayer who prayed fervently, Lord of the harvest, thrust forth laborers into the gangs of New York. And he would pray that prayer, pray that prayer. And one night it was said that he began to pray with an agonizing groan. It was so loud it woke neighbors and the police got called. And he was groaning and he was warring that the Lord of the harvest would thrust forth laborers into the gangs of New York and clean up the drug epidemic. That night that the police were called, that very next morning was the morning that David Wilkerson picked up that newspaper. You can't tell me that the Lord of the harvest is not giving us a clear message. Do you know what I think? I think David Wilkerson is an amazing man of God who was obedient, but I think without a Dick Simmons that was under the bridge warring day after day, God send laborers, send laborers, send laborers, then Teen Challenge wouldn't be here today. Thousands of men and women's lives would not have been drastically changed by the gospel of Jesus Christ. All because one man took verse 37 and 38 and said, I believe that the Lord of the harvest will thrust forth laborers and my prayers will shift his hand. Because one college woman picked up a sticky note at a prayer meeting and caught a revelation of what Iqbalo meant. And she began to say, Lord of the harvest, Iqbalo laborers to the Jap people. And they're swept into the kingdom like that. We don't need a program. We need people that will stand up and say, God, I've I have passively sat on verse 37 and 38. But what I'm saying to you today, Lord of the harvest, is that no longer will I passively sit, but I will take that verse and I will believe that you are who you say you are. And I am going to pray fervently. I'm going to pray with passion. I'm going to pray until we see that thing fulfilled and done. He may ask you to go. I believe that there are people in this room that will answer the call of being a Dick Simmons. I believe that there are people in this room that will answer the call of being an obedient goer as well, like David Wilkerson. But it starts with a commitment. It starts with a repentant heart to say, God, I haven't taken that seriously. 
And I'm willing today to change that. I'm willing, I believe that you will do all that you say you're going to do. And so I'm going to ask that you would stand and that you would, as hard as it is, try to block out every thought, every distraction. And I want you to just take a moment with the Lord and tell him that that you're getting it and that you hear his message, you've heard his call. And then what I want you to do is if you are really, truly ready to make a commitment and put yourself on the altar, put yourself as a living sacrifice on the altar, then I want you to come to the altar and make a commitment today that you will pick up the battle plan, that you will pick up the strategy of heaven that he's downloaded, and that you will pray. First, it's a prayer movement. Second, it's a go movement. So if you're willing to make that commitment of, Father, I will pray. Pray. I will pray, Lord of the harvest, thrust forth laborers. I will be obedient to the call and I will go. After you have spent a moment with him, if you're ready to make that commitment, then I want you to come to the altar and you're going to make that commitment to him. You're going to make that commitment to him. I'm just going to pray. Father, right now I ask that you... Lord of the harvest would speak to our hearts. God, thank you that your word is true, that you are not a man that you would lie, that you've given us the battle plan. God, I ask that we would have the strength and courage today to recommit ourselves to you, to make a new vow today, to forget the past, take a step forward and say, I am committing myself to prayer. I am committing myself to being obedient to Christ. Our prayer is that God will take this word and plant good eternal seeds deep into your soul. Father, we pray for your great wisdom to infiltrate this listener, draw them to you, and take them gently down the road to their next destination in life. And if you're in need of a home church, we invite you to join us at Christian Heritage Church on Shera Road in Tallahassee, Florida, a multicultural church founded on the truth of God's Word and the power of the Holy Spirit. For a worship service where the presence of God has first place, you're invited to Christian Heritage Church. Sunday morning service is at 10.30, Wednesday evening at 7, plus youth group and kid power and small groups and more. For all the latest information, visit our website, chctoday.com.